Our mission here is simple, to explore how the innovations of Web3 can deliver on its potential to build a sustainable, more equitable world. Join us today as we learn how to navigate through Web 3.0 to build a better world. Here we are, welcome to Better Worlds. We're delighted today to have Paul Gamble with us, uh, the co-founder of Nori, a carbon marketplace and carbon removal cryptocurrency uh, based in Seattle, Washington. Welcome, Paul. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation with you. And I want to I want to start, you know, the car carbon uh, credits and carbon offsets and carbon removal and carbon sequestration are big topics and also slightly different topics. So I want to start with maybe your passion and your access point to this ballpark and to this um, this important work in the world. So yeah, when when did it click for you? When were you like, I need to do this and I need to gather people um, to do this together? Yeah, that was in 2015. So my, my background's in uh, software, computer engineering, and product management stuff. And I've been working at different agencies, building mobile apps for big clients, and eventually that got pretty boring. And in 2015, I left because I wanted to work on something bigger and more important. And it just seemed um, like, of course, more people are going to care about climate change in the future. And so I started a meetup group to find other people who are interested in this. Uh, and particularly what I wanted to focus on was how do we actually solve climate change and not just make it less bad, which is what it seemed like everyone else was working on. And if you like look at climate change, it's really straightforward. We're putting too many greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere. So why don't we pull them back out? In 2015, I couldn't find anyone anywhere who was working on this. And so that's why I started my meetup group was to to start investigating that and figuring out how you could get more people removing more carbon from the atmosphere. Yeah, so 2015, yeah, it's 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 interesting to know that 2015 was still a time where, you know, carbon sequestration um, wasn't even in people's consciousness really at all. It was mm -hmm. basically like a financial marketplace. I think I've watched a few of your videos where you explain that carbon offsets usually have a first sale price and then a second sale price, which basically means yeah. it's like a financial play, right? And Nori went be beyond that to really understand what is the, I don't know if you can call it that, but like the true price um, of CO2. Do you want to explain yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. So like what we're trying to get at is how do we get more people removing more carbon? That's the end goal. And then we work backwards from there. And that's not the way in which a carbon trading was originally set up. So going back to the late 90s, when the clean development mechanism was developed after Kyoto, the idea was that uh, the market designers wanted a tradable commodity asset. So you do some sort of carbon offset project, you get carbon credits, and then typically you would sell them to a broker who will then sell them onto someone else. And the idea was that if, if you have these trading and being sold and resold, then you have a price and you can build a market around that. Now, that intuition is correct. You do need to have a tradable commodity asset for anything that you want to scale up like that. Like our entire economy runs off of global commodities markets like this. Like if you want to know the price of oil today, you go look at different reference prices that exist, like Brent crude, West Texas Intermediate. You can do the same thing for corn, a bushel of corn, a bushel of wheat, whatever. So that was the intent behind that. But when you think about it, when it comes to carbon, it's a little bit different. It's not the same thing as a barrel of oil. Because what we want is more people removing more carbon and like we'll never remove enough. So like we, we always want more of that. And when you do some sort of carbon offset project and you sell that to a broker and then that broker marks up a little bit because he or she's got to make a little bit of take on it too. Then they sell it to someone else, and then that person is going to sell it on to someone else and someone else. And in the end, that the second sale, third sale, fourth sale, that does not create any new incentive for uh, the original project developer to pull more carbon out of the air or, or avoid carbon emissions. All it's doing is enriching middlemen. And when I first started researching this space, I was looking at like how big is this overall market? How much money are people spending on carbon? And the... Uh, with the analysts would break out primary sales, the first sale, from secondary sales, so anything that happens after that. And the secondary market dwarfed the uh, primary market in size. It was so much bigger. And to me, that just meant like there's a, a total failure in design here, and we need to do this in some sort of different way so that we can actually create that incentive for more and more people to pull carbon out. 
Yeah, this is, thank you so much for that explanation. I think this is, you know, the crux with a lot of uh, uh, things on in, in our current systems in our current world is like the incentive is usually uh, an, a financial one first, right? And then from mm -hmm. there, we same with crypto. I mean, we we have these amazing possibilities to to create more, you know, new decentral ways of of governing, of organizing, of systematizing. But first comes the you know the gambling on those markets, uh, and then we go through a ten year iteration of that, and then we learn and pivot and and build more, right? And it seems with carbon, possibly it's similar. Just in my own, you know, um, non-scientific words, the way I understand it really is we as humanity are are learning that there is a balance between uh, carbon and the other elements in our air. Probably mm -hmm. we want to find that perfect balance, like right under 300 parts per million um, yep. and and be a steward of the, the biosphere like that, right? Um, yeah, and we're going to have to do that forever. That's, and, yeah. and so that's the thing that I think people who are maybe new to this space don't fully understand, which is that there is a supply side problem here. Uh, this is not really a demand side liquidity issue. Like there's basically limitless and infinite demand out there from mostly companies who want to be carbon net zero, but there's not enough carbon being pulled out of the air. And so think about it like as a, as a, as a human species, uh, as human civilization, we have to be building a like metaphorical factory that's capable of removing well over 50 billion tons of CO2 every single year. And once we get up to that sort of throughput capacity, that's going to have to run forever for the rest of human civilization on Earth. Like that's never going to stop. We it, just as you put it uh, quite well, we have to be stewards of the carbon cycle now. And so that means that we have to put most of our efforts on getting more supply side, getting more people, removing more carbon, making it less expensive to pull more carbon out of the air and figuring out how to build up to that extremely large scale. Like 50 billion tons is mind bogglingly large compared to what we're capable of doing as a planet today, which is more like a million tons at the most. Uh, so uh, th there's a long way to go from there. And the way to do that is with pricing and financial incentives. That's the only, like, you know, a sort of capitalist expansion of this industry. That's really the only way to get up to that size. And that is ultimately why at Nori, like our big focus is on creating real true price discovery for what is the actual value of a ton of CO2. And when we look at the ways in which people are trading and retrading carbon credits, that does not get us closer to real price discovery. That is just pushing a piece of paper around right. by middlemen. Yeah. So the, the financial incentive is important, but then if it's only about pushing the financial uh, piece of paper back yeah. and forth, it creates secondary and tertiary markets. Well, you say right. something, Paul, that, you know, pulling uh, carbon out of the air, I wanted to mystify that a little bit. The, the, the ways I'm mm -hmm. familiar with of, of, you know, carbon capture is afforestation, direct air capture, uh, biochar. And I think, obviously, for me, this is one of the, the passions I've been podcasting about is regenerative agriculture. Now, I know Nori is very much focused on the regenerative agriculture part because it's not, you know, you metaphorically said like a machine, a factory that pulls carbon out. Now, that seems a little almost dystopian to me personally, but I, I think when we look at the, the traditional practices of how we interact with the soil, uh, you know, through regenerative agriculture, it actually becomes quite quite a bit more clear and obvious. Like it also has simply to do with the way we grow food and we build other systems on the planet. And we need to be able to quantify that and track that so that we're, as we said before, stewards of this exchange. Yeah. Yeah. I never sort of predicted that I would end up working in the agricultural space. Uh, and, and Nori is agnostic. Like we're, we're not just going to do regenerative agriculture. Uh, we want to be the marketplace where all different methods of carbon removal can come and start selling their carbon and get that monetized. Um, it's just that the way we started like breaking this down, like let me go back to kind of the basics of like, how do you create a carbon credit? Well, traditionally that's been done by the offset registries, which are these nonprofit organizations like Vera or Gold Standard. And they uh, create what are called protocols that define how you measure and verify the credits. And then they issue them. And you can think of it sort of like they're a database of serial numbers that maintain like the list of ownership, like who owns what carbon credit. Well, 
one of the things that when I first started learning about this, I just thought that that's sort of silly. Like, like this is just basic software uh, database stuff. And this is also where blockchain is like really the perfect application to uh, facilitate like provenance, like listing out who owns what. Um, the ways in which the offset registries work is their revenue all comes from fees that they charge on the supply side. So you pay registration fees, listing fees, transaction fees, and even consulting fees to develop your protocol. And you can you could be spending thirty to one hundred thousand dollars or more just to get your project created and certified. And it could take years, literally years, to go through this process with the registries because they're quite slow. So when Nori was getting started, we realized we cannot work with these registries. They are incapable of scaling. And uh, if we're trying to focus on the supply side of this, then we have to make it less expensive and we have to make it easier for suppliers to generate their projects and get those uh, credits created and sold. So we started approaching it from how do we standardize the ways in which we do measurement and verification to really dramatically bring down that cost? And and rather than approaching it on a, like a project by project basis, which is how the registries do it, so that w is what led us to starting uh, by focusing on regenerative agriculture, because it is really the only method that is available today that is capable of scaling to millions of tons uh, a year right now. Uh, if we look at some of the direct air capture and more engineered industrialized solutions like uh, their carbon negative cement. Um, uh, manage mine tailings, stuff like that. Like it, it's out there and we will need that. Uh, but they are doing on the order of thousands of tons a year, not millions. So we started with the regenerative agriculture as the way to generate lots of inventory, help get us, uh, help us get this market off the ground, start creating real price discovery. And actually pretty soon, um, we, we will be coming out with our, um, our own sort of proposal on how we're going to standardize across the different types of carbon removal, because the market seems to be valuing these somewhat differently, uh, depending on the type. And what we're going for is a commoditized market where we have some sort of uh, standard unit of account uh, that can be traded. Uh, um, well, the, the token can be traded, but the, for the carbon to be purchased in a sort of standardized way. Uh, so we started with regenerative ag, uh, but we will be expanding to other methods as the volume scales up. Right on. I'm glad that, to see that regen ag is not just a, um, you know, um, something that makes sense from the farming and soil perspective, but then also makes sense from the soil and bigger, you know, carbon um, cycle perspective. Yeah, and, and, it, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a marketplace win -win. for. Yeah, it's a win-win. That's for sure for yeah. planet people and. And profit, and and so I want to I want to move on into the digital assets though that you guys have created because I think this is another really exciting part about um, about Nori specifically. And so you've created two digital assets. One is the NRT, uh, a carbon mm -hmm. credit, right? And the other one mm -hmm. is a, your own cryptocurrency called Nori Token. Um, mm -hmm. So how do they relate to each other? So the NRT is what is created when someone does the carbon removal and they go through measurement and verification, and then they sign a contract, and then we issue the NRTs to them, and then those could be sold. Those are actually NFTs, and when they're sold, they're immediately retired. So that's carbon market language saying that the end buyer is taking final ownership. This is how, like, I, how I strongly believe that we should not be trading carbon. By doing immediate retirement, that's ensuring that the carbon cannot be resold. That's the NRT. The Nori token is the uh, medium of exchange. It's the method of payment for the NRT. So the cost of one NRT, which is one ton, will always be one Nori. And that Nori, that relationship will remain fixed one to one, but the Nori price will float relative to dollars or whatever currency uh, based on supply and demand. And this is where our token economic design comes in. Uh, basically, we'll be uh, what we have created 500 million Nori tokens, and there's a schedule on how these get released and sort of um, that sort of thing. You can find that on our website. But the idea is, it, as demand for carbon uh, purchasing increases through the Nori marketplace, the demand for the Nori token increases, but with a fixed finite supply then the, that should increase the price of the token, which increases the financial incentive to suppliers to enter the market. So the more that, the, uh, the more that carbon removal is worth, the more people who are going to remove carbon. And that's, our, that's the entire intent behind what Nori is doing, is uh, increasing that financial incentive to suppliers. So uh, think about the Nori token like a, a gift card. If you hold one Nori, you have not bought carbon yet, but you have the ability to use it to redeem it 
for a ton of CO2 through the Nori market. And this enables interesting sorts of things because you could say, uh, maybe you are a uh, savvy CFO at a company that's trying to offset your carbon. And you know that you're going to have to offset 100,000 tons every year for the next three years. You could go out and purchase 300,000 Nori and now you have these 300,000 gift cards and you just paid a price, whatever price in fiat that you paid for them. That's your effective carbon price. And then you use them to redeem them over time. But if the carbon price has gone up over time, you've now effectively secured a discount. So this is a way that we, uh, by introducing this model, uh, buyers can start hedging against carbon price increasing. Uh, and it also enables really good benefits on the supply side too, because especially when we work with farmers who are very familiar with this type of concept where they, you know, they're, if you're like a corn grower, a corn and soy grower in the Midwest US, you are harvesting your uh, grain at the end of the season, and then you're storing it in a bin until you see a global commodity price that you are willing to sell at. Maybe you'll, you'll sell in tranches as time goes on. A, a lot of them spend a lot of time doing this kind of thing. So they're used to the concept of like having this thing that they've harvested, and they're waiting for the price that they want to receive for it. And this token works exactly the same way. So they're, they're doing the carbon farming, they're generating the NRTs and getting those uh, sold and converted into Nori tokens. And now they hold these tokens and they can choose to sell at whatever price is appropriate for them. So that's how we get like actual price discovery happening. And if they think that the carbon price will be higher in the future and they don't necessarily need the cash flow, then they can hold on to it. But if they need the cash or they want to sell right now or they think the price is going to go down, they can sell right now. It gives lots of different optionality to both sides. And that's how we create an actually robust global commodities market for carbon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and with that first step of really creating a clear price for carbon and then also addressing the, the permanence, right? Um, I have a question about, mm -hmm. you know, clim climate tokens in general. So we've seen a mm -hmm. few of them uh, in the recent past month kind of crashing, like, you know, Toucan or Clima uh, DAO and, um, you know, just, you know, how do you think in general they might recover, but then also how is NRT different? Well, I don't, I, I can't really speak to the first question. Um, I, they have fundamentally different models. Um, mm -hmm. Their approach is uh, more based around creating more demand for carbon credits and they're totally fine with them, um, with those carbon credits selling and being and being resold and traded. So that there's that like fundamental disagreement there uh, philosophically on whether or not carbon should be trade retraded. Um, how well how does it differ? I think ours is far more I think intuitive uh, because one nori is the carbon price, and that's not like Klima has this uh, you know their fork of Olympus DAO, and so it's this bonding mechanism and and uh, a somewhat complicated uh, underlying token economics for how it works. Um, and the other thing is, I, I haven't seen any of these other markets or, or token-based projects that are focused on the supply side, which is the real root problem of the issue. Uh, because if you're going to be dependent upon carbon credits that are coming out of Vera or Gold Standard or one of the other registries, you're always going to be short on supply, or there's going to be a race to the bottom to the junky carbon credits that Vera has approved in the past, which is exactly what happened with Klimadow, where they were, they were buying, um, millions of credits from a 2012 hydro dam project in China that basically everyone agrees at this point didn't have any real significant impact on the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And so it's, it's all about the supply. And uh, if anyone is not focusing on the supply side, then I think they're getting the problem wrong. And I think that they're not going to actually make the impact that they want to make. Very interesting. Yeah. And, you know, personally, I think it is important to understand both the the supply side really well, right? Um, because it's there's going to be a, a lot of companies on the demand side that will continue to need and want mm -hmm. uh, to, to you know to kind of um, at least I mean I'm now I'm using the word offset, but to to get into balance with what they're you know what they're leaving behind, and then also I mean when it comes to you know climate, I think most people are really skeptical when it's just another gambling marketplace, as we said before. Mm -hmm. And and I think right rightfully so because we've seen too too many stories about that. So finding that real price and making it based on supply, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm curious about you know um, concerns raised about 
projects and transparency and proof of impact and auditability because i mean this is also still something that we we have to really define and discover when it comes to carbon right um how does nori yeah. address those those issues yeah so earlier i was explaining how we don't work with the registries we have our own methodology so the first few years of our operations like we were founded in 2017 and the first few years was were focused around building up that methodology for regenerative ag and soil carbon in the U.S. And so what we do is we collect a lot of operating data from farmers about what sort of practice changes they've made, uh, when they adopted no-till or reduced tillage, uh, what cover crops they're planting, where their fields are located, and, and so on. And we need that data going back uh, quite a while, to so the year 2000. And then we send that off to a third-party company called Soil Metrics. And Soil Metrics is a spin out from Colorado State University. And they're using a, a data model that was developed by uh, the US Department of Agriculture. It's called Descent. And what they do is they uh, do soil sample testing around the United States. And um, they basically have like a map of the US and there's like 1,200 triangles on it. And they're doing soil, regular, consistent soil sampling within those uh, areas. And then they're overlaying um, satellite imagery, weather data, soil type maps. Uh, I think it's like 34 different data models all in one. And based on that, so we, we send them the, the, the data about where the fields are and the practice changes. And then based on the, all of the uh, data that's in their model, they're able to say, this is how much carbon is going in the ground relative to what would have happened if you had continued with conventional practices on the same field. And so that's the quantification piece. And then the data that the farmers provided to us, that gets audited by a third-party verifier. So a uh, third-party verifier is looking at like invoices and receipts for seed and fertilizer purchases. They might be looking at satellite imagery. They're looking at land title records to make sure that either the farmer owns those fields or they've got permission from the landowner to do the carbon and engage in this kind of long-term contracting that they're going to be consistent about that. And then the verifiers sign off on it. So it's this two-step process, quantification and then verification. And then at that point, the farmers sign a 10-year contract with Nori that says they're going to keep that carbon in the ground. And then they have to re-verify every three years that the carbon is still there. At that point, we issue the NRTs and they can sell them. When they go through the next verification event uh, three years from now, then at that point, they've actually been removing more carbon in years one, two, and three. And so then they can sell those NRTs from years one through three and then sign a new 10-year contract. So it starts out as 10 years, then it pushes out, ends up becoming 13, and then 16, and then 19, and so on. And that's how we are also ensuring permanence. So uh, there's consistent revenue and income coming in for the farmer. So they're continued uh, there's continued incentive for them to keep going with this. and uh, But we also have continuous verification, the monitoring, and ensuring that that carbon is still there in the ground. And by doing it in this way, where we have these third parties that we are we're collecting the data and sending it off to, we've managed to reduce the cost of this like over 90%. So I mentioned earlier, like it could cost thirty to one hundred thousand dollars to go through this process with the offset registries, and in our case, the farmer just pays the verifier. Uh, we don't charge the suppliers anything. The farmer pays the verifier roughly three to five thousand dollars per project. So it's a dramatic reduction in cost, and we're also able to ensure that the carbon is still staying in there consistently and giving them pretty regular revenue over time. Right. Well, I'm going to zoom out here. This this makes so much sense because not every you know farming project that can actually do really well, both on the regenerative uh, front as well as on the the soil health and the carbon cycling front. Right. Not not all of them are massive projects. And if we think of it like which world would you rather live in? The the world in which you know we have these massive scale huge farms and then uh direct air capture comp like factories right next to it and the, the farms don't care about the soil and the cycle of carbon because they just build a factory next to it that captures carbon or the other picture that you just painted is we, we empower, enable, and incentivize everyone, um, basically, to become part of that who is in the regenerative agriculture space, right? Um, so that it, the entry barrier is, is so much lower. This makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I, 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 Fair. Because... <laughs> Uh, I'm just painting when, which world would I'd rather live in, right? I, sure. I sometimes, yeah. I sometimes am very skeptical with a very industrialized vision of um, uh, what's coming in because that's what got us into some of these 
problems in the first place, right? It's the over-industrialization sure. of our world. Yeah, I definitely understand um, where you're coming from there. I do think, though, that the math requires both. Um, like the total, the like the the total um, potential for soil carbon storage is at most five billion tons a year, and that's we're talking about like croplands around the world everywhere. So earlier I was saying we need to build this like factory that can do fifty billion tons. So that's ten percent. I mean that's significant. That's a really really large amount. So way bigger than anything that we're capable of doing today. But it's not going to be enough. And even if you include afforestation, kelp, which uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to do better measurement and verification with that, biochar, other things. Back of the envelope math, you're looking at maybe a cap of 20 billion tons a year, which, again, is still enormous and is much bigger than like the UN is calling for. But I, I think that they're underselling the problem. Uh, so if you get up to 20 billion, where's the rest of that 30 billion going to come from? It's going to have to be engineered industrialized solutions like direct air capture, which also then necessitates an enormous amount of energy that is also carbon free. And so the, it, at the same time as we're going to need to be scaling up direct air capture and other types of like embedding carbon in construction materials and so on, we're going to have to be building out the nuclear energy industry because it is, it is literally the only technology that's possible uh, to scale uh, to that size. I've seen estimates ranging from we need to 2x to 10x the total global energy output just to power the uh, DAC facilities that need to be built. So it, uh, it's a massive, massive scale up operation. Um, and so we often have the we, we're often saying inside Nori, like it's all of the above, like we have to do all of these things in tandem together. And that's why we're agnostic to the different methods of removal. Um, we don't think that we should be picking winners and losers. We want to let market forces determine that. Yeah, thanks for elaborating on that. I'm curious about, you know, um, what you have learned, in, you know, as in one of those <laughs> challenges over the last 24 months and like maybe one of the most surprising moments um, of taking it from startup to where it is now. I think several things like my, uh, there were a couple hackathons that we did before the company was founded. And in the very first one, we made the assumption that the carbon uh, measurement piece was going to be somewhat trivial. And you could just like stick a sensor in the ground or something like that and measure the soil carbon. And that the hard part was going to be the crypto economic adoption and uh, that sort of design. And it's exactly the opposite in reality. Um, we are um, uh, five years into this now, and uh, we've spent all that time uh, building out the carbon side of the business. And it's only... Uh, now and very soon, I'm not sure exactly when this is going to air, but very soon when we will be launching that Nori token for the first time. So we've done all of our sales so far with cash at an arbitrary fixed price just to get the carbon side of the business going. So that was a, a big surprise to me. Like we're, It's taken a long time to get to this point where we can actually have this uh, robust token launch. Another surprise was that we initially thought that we were going to be selling to the sorts of customers that you hear about all the time. So the corporations who are making carbon net zero commitments and that sort of thing, which there's like an enormous amount of demand from those types of companies, but they often have so much bureaucracy and inertia behind the ways in which they do this that uh, our sort of newer model where we offer an insurance mechanism and we make this commoditized and we source the projects for you. You don't really, really have to do any of the work. That would be the very people who are responsible for making purchasing decisions at a giant company are the ones who would be put out of a job if they were just purchasing from us because we make it so easy. So instead of selling to these big corporations, we sell to the entire rest of the market who has never bought carbon before. And I believe the demand from that size of the market is significantly larger. Um, we've also been selling to uh, crypto companies and Web3 protocols. And the other thing I find interesting about this is, like, think about it this way. If you are a big uh, tech company and you're doing carbon offsetting, your goal, your objective is to reduce your carbon footprint and reduce the amount of money that you're spending on carbon offsets over time. Like you would like to get to uh, like zero emissions if that were possible. It's not possible, but you'd like to get as close as you can to that. So from Nori's perspective, where we are selling carbon removals, uh, that's a customer that becomes less valuable over time. 
So usually in business, you don't want to focus on customers who become less valuable. You want to find customers who are going to become more valuable over time. So for us, that uh, is coming out of the crypto space. And that's because it's more common there for companies to think about not, not like how much carbon do I have to remove, but how much carbon can I remove? And a good example of this is uh, the company Step In, which is a move to earn game. You earn tokens by going on runs or walks or jogs. And they put a percentage of their profits towards carbon removal. So that means that as they grow in size, as they become more profitable, they remove more carbon. Uh, whereas as a tech company grows, they are trying to reduce their carbon. So that's that's been the other interesting like learning we've had is, uh, although I did have an intuition about this a long time ago, that it's really going to be, I think, crypto networks and protocols that can actually scale up the demand to meet the size and scope of this actual problem. Um, we're not going to solve carbon in the atmosphere on the backs of Fortune 500 company uh, net zero commitments alone. Yeah, here, here. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the next generation of blockchain and what you've learned about that too and what you're seeing because, you know, it's still like such a big topic for most people tuning in. Um, and any kind of inroads or, you know, understandings from people that are co-creating um, this at the moment is, is really helpful. Well, you know, the interesting thing is we just see blockchain as the tool that makes this stuff possible. Um so we're recording this in early September, and the Ethereum merge has not yet happened, but it's a few days away. And that's a really exciting moment because that means that all of the associated energy usage and carbon emissions that come from operating that blockchain are basically going to go away almost to zero. And that's really, really exciting. And it's, it's been interesting. And it goes back to what I was just saying, too, because we've, we've had a lot of customers in the crypto space. Uh, especially NFT marketplaces, that kind of thing, purchasing from us because they're concerned about their Ethereum-based carbon emissions. And as those go away, then the question becomes, are they still going to buy? And that's where this narrative of like, it's not about being carbon neutral. It's about being how, how carbon negative can you possibly be? How much carbon can you remove? And, and so I, I think that that it has been established culturally. Like the merge itself, the fact that it's happening when it is happening, it was more or less moved up in schedule because if the Ethereum development community started to become more and more concerned with the carbon emissions that were resulting from operating the network. So there is this like large cultural movement within the blockchain and crypto space to be more sustainable, to be part of the solution and not really causing the problem so much anymore. And, and we're just at the start of that. And um, like I've been in crypto since 2011. And over the last uh, 11 years, I have seen just, you know, continued rapid innovation. And the more and more um, that this stuff grows, the more value that is created, the more these new networks are, are evolving, the more uh, interesting solutions that we're going to see. So it just seems inevitable to me that like crypto networks are going to be uh, are going to play an enormously important role in the scale up for solving climate change. Yeah, big time. Um, you know, 11 years makes it sound like this space has been around forever, but really we're still just at the very beginning of the, That's like the whole time. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> just at the very, very, very beginning. I mean, even mm -hmm. just the internet has been around for like 25 years ish for the consumer. Right. So it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, let's, um, let's see what can, what can happen. I think there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff in front of us, Paul, I'd love to close with getting, um, you know, just a statement from you, maybe some advice you could give to younger people listening in our audience about the future opportunities in blockchain and the environmental space as you're just pointing mm. at it. Well, the biggest challenge that we run into and will continue to run into is around measurement and verification. And so if there are entrepreneurs out there who are looking for like, where are the gaps, where are the spaces that they can like fill in and what's needed, that's the biggest one. So I would encourage anyone to, uh, try to uh, find new ways, whether that's through nature-based stuff or engineered industrialized stuff. Um, that's, that's very, very much needed. Um, with the, I, we didn't really talk about this, but I got started by starting a community. I formed a meetup group in Seattle um, to find other people in 2015 who are interested in carbon removal. And the communities have become much more of a thing uh, since then. And so I would encourage people to look at groups like Air Miners, who is probably my favorite. Air Miners is a carbon removal community that aims to help people who want to get started in carbon removal, want to start business, find co-founders who are going to work on that sort of thing. So go to airminers.org. They've got these really great um, 
uh, like training camps where you can kind of learn quickly about all the different ways you can remove carbon. Um, I, uh, otherwise just like continue experimenting and continue, uh, trying new things. It's that rapid innovation that makes the, these two industries like put together. It's like so interesting to me, uh, because we have seen like massive, massive change ever, even since we started the company in 2017. Um, so I'm excited to see what, uh, what's going to come in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, I'm excited with you, especially, you know, from the perspective of transparency, blockchain and taking taking those reins out of the hands of the few. And, you know, I mean, this mm -hmm. is, again, like my, my own vocabulary, but putting it into a more open source quotation marks here, kind of yeah. space where, you know, all of humanity of those who can build and co-build are, are part of it. And so i um, really, really excited. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for what you're doing with Nori. And um, yeah, stay, stay tuned for more to come. It sounds like, you know, we're... We're, we're up for quite the revolution when it comes to um, the carbon space, but also, you know, just, just this process of understanding. We're here as stewards on the planet, and we've just learned in the last 20, 30 years that we're part of the carbon emission cycle. And so yep. um, how we sequester back into the soil is, is important. Well, thanks for having me, Elaine. <laughs>